Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear Chi Ryan Chung, thank you very much for the invitation to speak on the Korean ICU Rehabilitation Annual Conference. My name is Peter Neidal. I'm from North Germany, Kiel, and I've got no conflicts to declare. I will talk about ICU rehabilitation studies, the past, present, and the future. You will learn about 21 videos, <laughs> how to walk on ECMO, development of early rehabilitation and critical care, current state of evidence-based rehabilitation, and hopefully future opportunities. This year, um, a systematic review about videos, not literature, but videos, um, how to work with patients on ECMO was published by Gazato at Collex. And uh, it was very funny, but also interesting review because they, they collected really videos on YouTube and TikTok and or Vimeo and uh, other platforms. And they found, of course, videos how to walk uh, with patients uh, on ECMO. The editors invited Sabrina Ekman and myself to uh, write an editorial about this. And the title was, Don't Try This at Home <laughs> Without a Trained Team. And when we reviewed this uh, systematic review, um, I was wondering, how, how is it possible? How, how can teams be able to work with patients on ECMO. I'm a, I'm a nurse. I'm working since 30 years in critical care. And when I started in 1991, no one with ECMO was even awake. So uh, how did it develop from deep sedation to walking patients? And I will tell you this um, story. Well, the paradigm in the early 90s were we protect patients by deep sedation and immobilization. This was best evidence and this was best practice. Keep, keep them calm, <laughs> sedated. Then you've got reduced oxygen consumption. That's, that's good for the heart, for the brain, for the lungs. They have no stress. And the, the breathing machine has a better possibilities to, to make a job to ventilate patients because fighting against the ventilator was a serious issue during this time. So better deep sedation. But it was very difficult to wean these patients. And Wes Ely published 1996, the first daily spontaneous breathing trial. If you perform this daily, you can reduce the weaning time by 25%. Just switch off to a pressure-supported ventilation mode and see, does something happen? Does the patient show some hidden activity? Can you, can you enable an early training? And this is highly effective and, and highly significant, was great. But patients didn't woke up. So <laughs> Chris performed a similar trial as uh, Wes Ely. He stopped sedation. In, in, uh, during 24 hours, uh, just one sedation stop, and patients had the chance to wake up. This reduced over sedation, reduced metabolites in, in the body, of course. He used drugs with a shorter half time, because if you have to wait for 24 hours till the patient wake up, it's uh, too long. And they started with less sedation after the, the sedation stop. So they were adapting to less sedation and Days on mechanical ventilation and in ICU was reduced by 30%. Highly significant. Great job by Chris and colleagues. But when patients woke up, Wes Ely noted they are all delirious, <laughs> serious issue. And he developed the CAM ICU. And it's uh, you all know the CAM ICU today, I hope. It's a reliable, valid method for identifying delirium and can be approved by uh, physicians, nurses, therapists. Please, all physiotherapists, learn the CAM ICU because delirium is a very, very important outcome for your work, but you have to show it. So learn a CAM ICU. It's a, it's a good uh, assessment. Then 2007, Polly Bailey from the United States proved that early mobilization for patients even with an endotracheal tube, an ETT, is feasible and safe. In her weaning ICU, she mobilized patients out of the bed, sitting on the bed, standing in front, sitting in a chair, walking across the ICU, like shown in these pictures. She did it for 593 times, and no single unwanted extubation removement of the ETT. Polly Bailey showed 
in this observational trial, it has no high evidence, but it was a landmark study and that mobilization with patients on ETT is safe. Then Girard combined the daily spontaneous awaking trial with the spontaneous breathing trial, and he could reduce mortality after one year. When you combine both, stop sedation, make a spontaneous weaning trial, then patients have less days on mechanical ventilation, on ICU and in hospital. And the number needed to treat for one year mortality is seven. He wrote, every seven patients treated with the intervention, one life was saved. This is great. So when you stop sedation, when you perform a spontaneous breathing trial at the same time, then you save lives. And this was a brilliant study by this group um, and go went, went over the whole world. And this was the best practice and standard for a long time. Then William Schweiker published his uh, great um, study. He combined the daily waking breathing trial with rehabilitation within 72 hours after admission. And this improves independency, proved by the Bartle as a scale, by 50% and reduces mechanical ventilation, delirium, and ICU days. He used a mobility team, like shown on the picture. Oh, oh this is our physiotherapist. Um, <clears throat> this is the, the right picture. Um, physiotherapist, uh, a nurse, and a, a nurse help us. And they walk around and mobilize patients during the daily spontaneous waking trial and breathing trial. And they had a really better outcome. They were more, more independent, less delirious, and, and so on. But he only included 5% of the general ICU population. So it was feasible for a few of patients, but the others with multiple morbidities or pre-existing frailty, they, they were not included. And this is quite um, a challenge. Then a strange guy from Denmark came, Thomas Ström, um, and he said, do patients really need sedation? They need analgesia, but not sedation. And they stopped giving sedation at all. So, and they, they proved the outcome in, in Denmark and they patients had the same results for anxiety, depression, PTSD as deeper sedated patients. Thomas said, he's a genius man, I, I really, adore him. And they said that they have larger and soft ETTs, which is surprising, but he said patients have better coping with this. And the nurse patient ratio in Denmark is one to one. Even in their publication, they mentioned this, that, that this non-sedation trial is only feasible with, with enough stuff at the bedside. When they started this trial, I interviewed um, Lotte Abilkren Schulz from, from his uh, ICU, when they started this trial, even in one nurse to patient ratio one to one, the nurses said, oh, how can we deal this? Now we need two nurses per patient. This was the first answer to Thomas' um, uh, protocol. But of course, they adapted to this and today they, they are fine with one to one. But it's challenging if one nurse has three patients and all three are awake. So maybe this will limit this non-sedation trial. Then 2012, uh, Dale Needham published the uh, post-intensive care syndrome statement paper based on the conference in Brussels. And we know today that we are saving lives but producing victims. The, the one year, five year outcome of critical care patients is not the best. And a lot of patients suffer from physical, mental, cognitive and social impairments years after ICU discharge and also the family are affected. So we have to, to prevent post-intensive care syndrome, ICU acquired weakness, for example, PTSD, uh, cognitive declines and things like that. 2017, the guidelines for family-centered care was published by the Society of Critical Care Medicine. Davidson was the leading um, author. And today we say loved ones, the family belong to the patients. They are the most important uh, person at the bedside, but they have a really complex role. They are vulnerable by themselves. They are representatives of the patient, counselor in existential decisions, caregiver sometimes, and also a responsible person for, for the family because they have to take care of the children, uh, financial aspects and things like that. So um, take care of the, of the family. They belong 
to the patient. Then one year later, the PEDIS guideline was published and it was the first guideline that um, focused on immobility or mobility and sleep disturbances. Um, they focused also on delirium prevention by using non-pharmacological interventions and uh, supported uh, all activities that can improve sleep. But there are two tables in the guideline and this table too lists all factors that can affect sleep. And you see all the, all the small all numbers that are studies that proved the significant effect of noise, comfort of bed, activities at other butt sites and so on. So supporting sleep is very important, but it's most difficult because it's so complex. And I appreciate all studies that are done in this uh, uh, area, but it's really challenging. So when we take a look back about 30 years now of uh, rehabilitation, we, we started with with the paradigm, we protect our patients by deep sedation and immobilization. And today we say we protect our patients by participation and mobility. Surprise, surprise. And even I, <laughs> starting 30 years ago, I'm surprised if I see a patient <laughs> with an ETT or tracheal tube walking on the ICU and I ask myself, how is this possible? And this is one challenge because the experienced nurses like I or others, we are often mentors for younger nurses. And when we teach them, we, we teach them our experiences. And this is a big challenge. And I want to ask all experienced older nurses, please reflect your first experiences and please uh, train them with the new best evidence we have today, not your oldest um, experience, because I hope, hope that all have um, developed also their own attitude. Today, we try to keep patients awake and mobile as possible. Of course, there are indications for deep sedation, no question, but the majority should, give a, should get a chance to being awake. And today, I have to say, mobilization is usual care. And as you see, patients can play guitar, for example. Um, around about 25% of patients on mechanical ventilation are mobilized, mobilized daily. Um, up to 50%, that's uh, the, the highest level. And on patients on non-mechanical ventilation, there are more than 50% mobilized daily. So in general, 80 to 90% of patients on the ICU are mobilized during their stay. And even out of the ICU mobilization is starting now, the British uh, uh, colleagues have a guideline now how to go out with patients. There is a project, a project called Hidden uh, Secret Gardens uh, for the ICUs and patients can make uh, exercises outside. This is genius. Even animal assisted therapy is feasible today um, in critical care. Um, if you follow hygienic rules, it's possible there are some dogs um, who are not highly infectious. And if you uh, teach them appropriately, um, patients can also make exercises, throw balls, and the dog has to run behind the, the ball, bring it back, and so on. It's brilliant. And also the British guys have a um, um, guideline for this. So best evidence is perform the complete ABCDF bundle. And uh, Brenda Pan uh, proved this. The more you perform the bundle, the better is the outcome. Reduce days in mechanical ventilation, less days in coma, less delirium, less physical restraints, and so on. And when it comes to early mobilization, use protocols, including safety aspects, use a team approach. It not Mobilization is not only the job of physiotherapists or not only by nurses. So work together, physicians, physiotherapists, nurses, speech, swallow therapists, occupational therapists, respiratory therapists, the family, get them all to, to the patient and perform mobilization. Use frequent and short sessions, not sitting for three hours once per day, but maybe three times for, for one hour is better than one long session reach the highest intensive level according to the patient, what is possible for him or her. And if you cannot perform mobilization for all and you have to select patient, best is for patients with a median severity of illness, Apache 2 score 15 to 22, and with patients with a longer stay. 
patients who stay only for one or two days or nights will not benefit from uh, intense training, but patients with a longer stay, three days, one week, and so on. Yes. Mobilization during pandemics, during the COVID patient uh, pandemic was impaired, of course. There was one genius trial by Kai Bun Liu who, who showed that just 10% of patients were mobilized um, during the, the pandemic. Um, and patients with COVID infections were more, more mobilized than non-infected patients because they, they had more uh, stuff at the bedside. But of course, this throw us back by 10 years. They were more deeply sedated and so on. So, so it was a cultural um, redevelopment. You know, I'm sorry. The future of the ABCDF bundle. Maybe, oh, no, not maybe, of course, we have to perform more implementation and we have to deal with staff shortage. This is a worldwide problem. Uh, staff shortage of nurses, of course, physiotherapists, and also of physicians. So maybe we need rehabilitation teams that go around. Maybe we need self-help manuals for patients or families, including videos and teaching videos how to move in the bed or virtual reality. We need money for rehabilitation. As you rehab must have extra points for payments, depending on your uh, financial system. But if ICU rehab is paid, if you mobilize more than 50%, as an example, then every hospital will buy in more stuff for mobilization and will create rehabilitation teams. If there is a, a benchmarking and you have to come over the benchmark, then you get payments. Of course, everyone will, will get new uh, th uh, stuff for it. Pre rehabilitation is highly affected. Uh, also, uh, before planned operations, but only in this case of planned operations. Nutrition is under research. I guess it has a small impact because patients do not perform exercises 24 hours. They just are doing 20 minutes or 60 minutes, but then you do not burn so many calories. So it has no, it cannot have a high impact. A neuromuscular electrical stimulation or cycling is good on top to exercises, but uh, there are still non-responder and we have to, to find out who is best for, for these uh, interventions. Robotics, as you see on the picture, is under research. And my question is, does it really help or is it more work for the nurses? And artificial um, intelligence for identifying most suit suitable patients by using any algorithms can be maybe helpful, but it's challenge ethics. Um, because um, it does not replace your own decision who is best for, for mobilization. So uh, be open-minded for new developments um, and try them, of course, but be also responsible for your staff and your patients. Here you see a video. I've got this from LinkedIn by uh, Wolf Günther, a patient playing the drums, and I love it because this is patient-centered mobilization. So there are 21 videos how to walk on ECMO, but don't do this at home without a trained team. We come from deep sedation, but today early rehabilitation become usual care. And please keep this attitude within your team. Best rehab is using protocols, team approach, highest intensity, and more frequent than once per day. And future opportunities are interesting, but first, we have to deal with staff shortage and pandemics. Thank you very much. Enjoy the conference and I'm open for your question. Thank you very much.